it's my great pleasure today to be able to introduce Arnold Wilder from Boston area. Um, I used to envy guys like Arnold Wilder because they got to go out and take pictures of steam and I said, why did I miss all that, Lord? What did, why were you punishing me? And then the other night I showed somebody a picture of a, a Rock Island unit and they said, wow, a Rock Island unit. Railroads are still changing. But Arnold Wilder is one of the pioneers of rail fan fandom. He, helped, he was a part of the first uh, fan trip ever run on American railroads. Uh, and he helped save, most importantly for White River Junction, 494. Now, there's a little confusion exactly how the 494 ended up in White River Junction because McGinnis had made some promises. Anyway, it's here, and this man is the reason, it's one of the reasons it's here, and he's going to share that with us today. So I'm happy to introduce Arnold Wilder. Thank you, Charlie. Thank you very much. <laughs> what we lack in numbers, we'll make up in uh, historical background. Let me just tell you that, first of all, the locomotive 905, as it was known to the railroad enthusiast family when uh, we found out about it, had previously been used on a line up in the White Mountains as a locomotive to move cars of coal from the Bretton Woods area up to the base station of the Mount Washington Cog Railway when the Boston, Maine had abandoned that line. And to some of us who know something about locomotive drive wheels, we have been amazed that they used this particular locomotive, a locomotive with 62 inch wheels, to haul cars, of, push cars, because they didn't haul them, push cars of coal up to the base station from Bretton Woods. And it was possible for them to, to handle only one car load of coal at a trip from about halfway up that branch line to the base station. Whatever the case, after 1932, when the Boston Maine ceased going on their own track and came into Bretton Woods on the Maine Central track, this line was used by this by the Mount Washington Cogway, we, we think, to move these cars of coal. And the most that I know about it is that it was setting on the siding at Bretton Woods when we used to be going by on the Maine Central train going to Portland. Subsequently, it was located in the Portsmouth engine house and a group of railroad enthusiasts uh, meaning fellows who were interested the same as you and I uh, determined that that was a very vintage locomotive and ought to be displayed at the coming New York World's Fair which was to open in 1939 as most of you remember. In order to do that this group of railroad enthusiasts were permitted to go in there at the first at the Portsmouth Engine House where with a bunch of putty knives and uh, uh, scrapers and, and uh, steel wool tried to clean up that engine. You can imagine the futility of it. It was then moved to the East Cambridge Engine House in uh, near Boston. And when the Boston and Maine family determined that we'd never make it, they got on the hook and moved that engine into the Billerica repair shops where it was prepared to go to the New York World's Fair in 1939. And it was a tremendous uh, job done for display of a, of a uh, locomotive to be displayed of historical nature. And this locomotive, through the efforts of the Boston Maine, was made possible a place in the New York World's Fair in 1939, along with a lot of other railroad equipment. This is the other side of the same locomotive. It was spit and polish personified. The Boston Maine family took the old steel cab off, took the old coal tender, took it apart, went out in the yards and found old-fashioned trucks that would befit a locomotive of that vintage and made it possible for this locomotive to really represent the era that it, that it did at the New York World's Fair. World War, I, World War II came along, as most of you know, and rumblings and one thing or another, and the locomotive was taken out of the World's Fair area and moved on its own wheels 
to East Fitchburg Engine House, where it remained during the, during the uh, span of the World War II. Then the Boston and Maine determined that they were going to take down part of that engine house and they moved it from there to Lowell Engine House, Middlesex Village to some of those more familiar. And then it was that this committee, a man by the name of Dana Goodwin from Fitchburg, Jim Duncan and myself, became a committee to try to establish a new home for this locomotive. And we interviewed a number of people and uh, most of them were not interested in anything but preserving uh, it own for their own use and what they would do it after they had expired or gone out of business, uh, they couldn't even explain. Summarize, we, we contacted the Hatford Historical Society here in White River Junction. And a man by the name of Walton Rector, who was the uh, reporter for the Valley News, Charles O'Brien, who was the postmaster at that time, and others, uh, there was a lady that I was in correspondence with, and I wish I could remember her name, who was down here at uh, Howard Johnson's motel. But whatever the case, the, Howard jo the uh, Hartford Historical Society prevailed upon us to move that locomotive here to Hartford, uh, White River Junction in essence, and they would find a permanent home for it among a great many retired railroad employees of both the Central Vermont and the Boston and Maine. And we went ahead with that idea and approached the Boston and Maine to refurbish the locomotive for a static exhibit. And they did a job for us, asking us how much money we had to spend. And we told them our treasury didn't have but $500. Okay? They gave us a receipted bill for $500. And one of the electricians down in the Billerica shop pointed out to us that every diesel locomotive that came into that shop, and he was a steam fan, not a diesel, every diesel locomotive got hung a charge for whatever repair was being done on that locomotive to bring it up to where they wanted it. And uh, many a diesel is wearing marks of the 494 today on that account. Okay, that's right. Well, uh, in the process, you're aware that through the historical records, the 905, as we knew it then, was to become the 494 as it is today. And the, uh, the uh, locomotive was prepared and ready for movement up here to White River. In the process, the Boston and Maine unhappily had inherited one Patrick McGuinness, a shyster president who had wrecked four railroads ahead of him, who took over the Boston and Maine Railroad by proxy, and who was there at the time this 494 was pictured beside one of the big mountain type 4100s. And McGuinness, in in typical fashion, turned to his friend Nelson Blount, who operated the, the uh, Cranberry Railroad down at Edeville, Mass, and said, how would you like a locomotive? Blount was no chump. He said, sure, I'd like it. I'll arrange it. And he gave orders to have the 494 moved down to Edeville, down to South Cava. Happily, we had friends in court. And Earl Cohn, assistant superintendent of the Bill Ricker shops, called me at where I was working and said, I don't have much time to discuss it, but if you approve, you're the first one of the committee I can get a hold of, here's what we're going to do. They had a shop train that ran from Lowell to Bill Ricker shops every morning and back at night. He told us that they were going to put that 494 on the shop train and move it to North Chelmsford, just above the Metal Six engine house, where there was a Y and where this train from Worcester to Concord, night freight, would pick that engine up sometime one o'clock in the morning and take it to Concord, New Hampshire. And it was going to be on just the right side of the every other day Worcester, uh, Concord to White River local freight. So that the next morning, 494 is in Concord, picked up by the Concord White River extra freight and taken into uh, Westboro Engine House, where it was put in stall one. And I say stall one for a reason, as you'll see. Of course, in due time, McGinnis met Blount and said, 
How did you like the locomotive I sent you? Blount said naturally, what engine? Well, it didn't take long for McGinnis to find out that it hadn't happened, and he was presidential heir, roared at anybody who would listen, and said, get that engine back, because somebody had to, of course, tell. All right, now the B&M men in White River Junction's hands are tied. They can't do anything about it, but their tongues weren't. So they get hold of the friends of the CV across the river. The Central Vermont had reciprocal switching arrangements in Boston Main Territory and the B&M and CV. And they said it was just pure coincidence that the, the uh, CV engine, switch engine, came over from White River. The switches just happened to be aligned. The timetable, the turntable just set right for stall number one. The CV switcher came across the river, nosed in on track one, picked up the 494, and took it to White River in the center of Vermont house. And the B&M boys, under their breath, told beginners where he could go. <laughs> and so now the stage is set. They had proposed to put the 494 down in back of the police station, which most of you are aware the location uh, today. We went looking for it, but in another crowd we didn't find it, but no matter. The irony of it was that the CV, the, the Boston and Maine wrecker here in, in uh, White River Junction was used to escort the 494 up onto the line going north and a track cut back in and crossed over Route 4 and backed into its location using this CV wrecker B&M wrecker to move it back into its position and it sat there for uh, however many years as you're aware today of course it's been brought up front the Union Station here is no longer a, an important passenger station as it was in those days and the locomotive itself has been placed on a place of, of uh, honor up here near the Union Station and just to prove it, you can hear the bell of the locomotive ringing today. That is, in essence, uh, what, it, uh, what has happened. But the uh, interim, the Hartford Historical Society, somehow or other faded from uh, its prominence as, as it affected the, the uh, caretaking of, of the 494 Probably some of the older railroad employees retired have fi also faded from the picture. And so that 494 had suffered somewhat from deterioration because of the lack of uh, maintenance. Now it seems it's been brought up here in a place of prominence and will be uh, in evidence here in the days ahead. I don't know whether you can see this or not, but this particular page shows both the 494 or the 905 as it was in those days before it was converted to its historical what, and the next one engine to it 906 looks much the way it uh, does out here today before it had been altered but it gives you an idea of the of the very uh, considerable amount of effort that had to be undertaken by the Boston and Maine family who uh, undertook as, a, as a, uh, an effort and, and a good citizenship uh, approach to see that that locomotive was not only properly restored to its own uh, arrangement, but through their influence, placed first in the uh, New York World's Fair in 1939, and then subsequently moved at no cost to the railroad enthusiasts who did own the locomotive, back first to East Fitchburg, then to Lowell, to the shops, and then, as I've mentioned, by devious methods against McGinnis's will uh, to White River Junction, or to Westboro, as it happened at the time. No particular uh, credit to anyone except that McGinnis proved his true worth by being a first-class shyster, working with his officers, and sold off all manner of Boston and Maine equipment which was not his to sell, was afterwards taken in a, as a federal offense and subsequently 
moved to Danbury Prison in Connecticut where he eventually died. But uh, this is not particularly of our concern or of yours except as a matter of interest that in spite of the presidential efforts, the 494 did land in White River Junction, is now on exhibition, and we hope that it will continue to be a, a factor of, of pre predominance in the days to come. This is our picture of it, and if there's any questions that you have in mind, I'd more than try to answer them, or I have a couple of good friends here who will help us. Okay, Tom. Now, I have a question. Yes. It sounds like from your story a lot of B&M employees went to the edge of getting fired to help this happen. Is that correct? I don't think that the man McGinnis ever found out how it happened. This, this is our opinion. The first thing he found about it, that it had landed in Westboro Engine House. A lot of B&M employees assisted. In they cooperated, cooperated in a very quiet manner to see to it that this was accomplished starting with our good friend, the assistant superintendent in the Billica shops. Because he was the man that arranged it and saw to it that it was moved and the timing was, was excellent because there was, at no time, did the locomotive stay around anywhere where McGinnis could uh, find out about it. It was in the engine house long before he even found out about it. And uh, as soon as he found out about it, it wasn't there very long. Because the CV boys took care of the situation uh, in a community effort to uh, assist the town of Hartford and uh, whatever the group is that is now in charge to continue to have that locomotive on the property for which we're very proud and the railroad enthusiasts uh, acknowledge that fact and are most appreciative of the effort that you men here have made in order to put it in the shape that it's in. What year did all this take place? 1957. 57. Yes. So that was just a couple of weeks ago. <laughs> That's right. Well, it was, it was, it, it took us, uh, it took us, the society, uh, quite a little while to arrange uh, for someone who would, who was capable of taking the locomotive and putting it on display, as is the case here with the then Hartford Historical Society. So it took that spot out there in 1957? No, it, it took the spot down back at the police station initially and it was brought in from the north line then down across on a quite a little grade down across route four near the overpass they built a substantial uh, wooden bridge over the highway so that, that locomotive could be back down gravity brought it down there by the use of the locomotive crane that was up at the end of the track subsequently they they uh, obtained a caboose which you see out there today which was added to it. But initially, it was just the locomotive. Is that Boston main caboose, too? Or? That's right. It is? Yes, it is. Yeah. And do you know, do you know when that caboose was built? 1921. 1921? I, uh, I've understood that it was early 20s. I, I never knew the exact date. Yeah, Charlie. Am I, am I correct that it is now sitting on the old Montreal main? In other words, there's yes. behind the depot there? Yes. A uh, little bit of an angle, perhaps, because it was convenient to put it in just that angle. But yes, the the Montreal Main, where where you saw it today, uh, well now straighten me out, press. Uh, that that side is next to the next to the line going from uh, from Windsor to yeah, well, Montpelier and, and well, North. The passenger equipment is today the display that Amtrak has. That was the Con River South. Right. Springfield. Right. The other side of the depot was what we call the Pompey Line that went up to Wells River and Montreal via the Canadian Pacific. That's right. But wasn't there a connection between the Boston and Maine from Boston that ran behind the depot for trains like that? Oh, oh yes, the, the track is still there, the Y. Yeah. And if, when a freight train came out of the, the freight yard, which of course is down below Nut Street, it used to go around the Y and then make a complete horseshoe turn and go up the hill to, uh, to Lebanon. It must have been a tough climb. It was, it was quite a climb, but uh, somewhere today we've seen a map, perhaps it's downstairs, that showed the original railroad lines that were in here, and there was a uh, lines crossed at the upper end of the station, where the line from, from 
Montpelier came down across and the B&M picked it up and went across going to Lebanon and Concord as well as the line that went from north and south between uh, Springfield and past the station up here and went north to uh, uh, Fally and Ely and uh, Newbury and those places to Wells River and on onto the Canadian Pacific side. This line where you see the train today is on the on the uh, center of Vermont as we call it uh, north and south. I'll always be the central Vermont. Sure. <laughs> and Boston and Maine. That's right. That's right. What, they, what they've done to it with Guilford and that sort of thing has nothing to do with what our historical regard is for the way the railroad was built and the purpose that it was to serve. One, one more question. Uh, when I came up here, there still looked like there was a steam house that heated standing, probably was used to heat standing passenger cars that were switched out. Is that possible? Very much so. Uh, that actually happened here. Yeah, because there were, when the train came in from Boston with the sleeping cars and stuff going to the CV, they laid here for quite a while. Okay. Otherwise, they might be here for maybe two hours before yeah. the train would come up from New York. So needless to say, with our, the climate they have up here, as you well know, yeah. uh, in the wintertime, they would freeze up. So they had to put them on steam okay. until such time as the train came up and then they could, the engine would provide the heat. In fact, they had several connections around the station that you could set passenger cars on and put them up the steam. There was still a yard there when I moved up here. Oh, yeah. Well, if you don't have any other questions, I can tell you that I've thoroughly enjoyed being up here today with you and relating a little bit of this history as to the 494's arrival and the uh, railroad atmosphere that prevailed in preventing the man McGinnis from doing something which had probably been a deterioration of uh, the 494 and everything that went with it. Nelson Blount himself was killed in an aviation accident in his own home in Dublin and uh, there's a fellow named of Bartholomew who operates the, uh, the uh, Cape Cod railroads down there. There's another group that has taken over the, the uh, Edeville Railroad and are going to operate it uh, of sorts because the track, even though the equipment was moved to Maine, still remains in place and they are operating excursions, so we're told. Oh, great. Yeah. But it's uh, a transition. We had a very great friend in the back in the days when 494 was involved by the name of Ellis Atwood, Ellis D. Atwood. And he owned this big cranberry plantation down in South Cava. And he it was who provided with us, provided the railroad enthusiasts with a great deal of entertainment and fun. We all went down there and worked with him to build the railroad of sorts because we carried ties and rails and so forth. And the, uh, the cars and locomotives came from Maine after they'd been abandoned, narrow gauge line, two feet wide. Uh, I expect everybody here knows the difference between narrow gauge and, and uh, standard gauge. But standard gauge is four feet eight and one half inches between rail centers. The narrow gauge has to be narrower than that and in this case the Edeville Railroad and that sort of thing is two foot wide, two feet between centers. And they were so narrow that the frames and that sort of thing hung outside the locomotive in order to keep it from tipping over. But these railroads prevailed up in Maine, a number of them, and this same Mr. Atwood uh, went up there and at junk prices purchased all this equipment, had it restored and operated it on his cranberry bog as long as he lived and for some time afterwards. And it is only just recently that most of that equipment has been moved to Portland down on the waterfront. And if you go to Portland up near the old Grand Trunk Railroad Station, you'll find most of that equipment on display. They've had a lot of difficulty in, in getting them to uh, use other than soft coal because the city people uh, don't like the smell of soft coal. Mm -hmm. Something that we relish very much. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. I hope it's been worthwhile. I don't want to steal any, any of Arnold's thunder.
You won't be. Anything you can add is a help. Oh, that he tells the truth and he's right. Here's a picture of a bunch of railroad enthusiasts working on the engine back in 1939. So he's right. See? <laughs> and another thing, to raise money back to those days, they gave these builders plates. They were selling them, oh, I don't know, maybe $5 a piece. And that's a replica hmm? exactly. Oh, you take that off. That's oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. They want you walking away with it. No, no. I would like to know. back on the engine. I don't know. But it should go to somebody that is somewhat connected with the railroad history here. Years ago, they stole the weather vane off the railroad right. station. They, they, also, they, they also welded to the train. They yeah. also took the front plate off. Can you hold oh, it? Oh, yeah. 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 So, yeah. And yeah, you can't guarantee anything right there. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. But thank God you guys saved that engine. That's, that's, there aren't many of them left at all. Uh, American yeah, Standard. Maybe you didn't take a close up of those two. All right. Those two photographs. Because that's as good a shape as she I think it's like that. It wasn't kind of good. Yeah, it's kind of. I just want to note that this is the way the locomotive looked as 494 when it went to the New York World's Fair in 1939 with the assistance of the Boston and Maine uh, shop forces. That is the right side of it, of course. This I'll go for the fireman side. That's right. Now we have the fireman side. No. Huh? Okay. On the same locomotive, taken about the same time, in order to show how she looked when she was prepared. Going to the shops, going to the uh, World's Fair, of course, the rods and that sort of thing, the cow catcher and that sort of thing, with a, with a Janney uh, coupler on the front end and, and a lot of other things like that removed in order to conform to present day standards. But this is the way she was on exhibition in New York and very much the same way as it is up here in White River Junction. And you can see where the, the, the number plates show up there. The yes, builders this builder's plate. Could I see that number plate too? Is, is that it, the 494 number plate? That was, that's a replica of what was on the engine on both sides of the smoke box in the engine. It isn't the original. No, it is not the original. No, I wouldn't be. I'd be ashamed to admit if it was the original. I'm sure. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, we could make a replica of that, couldn't we, and, and put it up there? Sure. Like any other society, you're probably aware that among railroad enthusiasts, there are those who will go in onto private property and appropriate anything that is not nailed down, some of the things that were, and what they will do for them, because everything around the railroad is very heavy and very difficult to move, but that didn't deter some of the fellows who've done it. And uh, Have you still got the marks on your hand when we were taking the order board down at in Haverhill Station? You I expect I do. <laughs> that, that train order board signal came down like a thousand a brick, yeah. landed on my hand, and I wasn't much use for some time to come, one-handed anyway. No. Thank you.